So welcome everyone. Today we have the second meeting that is tied uh, to Bill Viola's exhibition at the Pushkin Museum. My name is Elena Stulikova. I'm the head of this project. Then we have Kira Perov, the co-curator of the exhibition. And she's also the co-producer of his studio. I would love to thank our sponsors, the VTB Bank, since they allowed us, enabled us to have this exhibition. And I also need to thank Kira and Bill for their help and work because they helped us to organize the exhibition and uh, to uh, have it uh, and to bring it to Moscow. It wasn't easy because a lot of museums can hardly uh, show contemporary art. They're just not equipped for that. But for Bill Viola, this is not the first time when he has to tackle this problem. So now I think we're ready to begin with the question. In, in our exhibition, we show works from different series. They cover various themes that Bill works with, and they show how he works with the space. For instance, the Tristan series was created for the opera of Tristan and Isolde, while transfigurations uh, were made for the ocean without shore, shown at Venetia, at the Oratorio San Gallo Church during the Venetian Biennale. Maltes were created for the St. Paul's Cathedral in London, etc. So these pieces are all very different. Kira, could you please tell us how were these works made and how the spaces around them influenced the creation process? And what is the difference between working for the church and opera? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Alina. Uh, your enormous uh, efforts and help uh, on the exhibition uh, uh, were just astounding. Uh, to create a whole exhibition in this uh, period of COVID uh, or completely by remote um, uh, was, uh, was a major feat in and of itself. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here with everybody uh, it's kind of strange seeing these little boxes and everybody in them, but it feels to me like I'm speaking to an audience, which is really nice. Um, regarding your question um, about architecture, um, right from the beginning, um, Bill was interested in space rather than the object. Uh, when Bill lived in Florence uh, in the early 70s, instead of immersing himself in Renaissance art, looking at paintings and going to museums, uh, he was fascinated by the interiors of ancient churches and cathedrals. Uh, he spent uh, a lot of time with an audio tape deck, tape recorder, and recorded the sounds that contained um, muffled voices, uh, echoes, and the deep vibrations of the architecture. This impulse came from uh, his training as a composer and a musician, interestingly enough. This experience greatly influenced his approach to sound in later years. Um, it is the ambient sound um, that you hear in some of the works such as Tristan's Ascension, which you have at the, at the Pushkin. Uh, when, 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 uh, at the beginning uh, of the work and at the very end of the piece, um, sounds like you're in a large space with echoes, layers of different recordings of unrecognizable nature sounds that add depth and color. Um, the first uh, commission for a cathedral uh, was in 1996. Um, Durham Cathedral in the Northeast England is a thousand years old. It's a UNESCO. Uh, it's a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, maybe we can tell about the process for putting the exhibition together. 
At the beginning, we had different ideas on how this exhibition should look, but after Kira came to Moscow and she took a look at the Pushkin Museum, we began to elaborate the exhibition. So I'd like to ask Kira how your visit to Moscow influenced your perception of the future exhibition or didn't make any difference. Um, no, it, it made a huge difference, of course, because the space is, the, is where we start first, the architecture of the building. Uh, we, that's if, uh, because, because many of the pieces require volume and not just a flat wall to put things on. And so if things don't fit, if things, uh, sometimes we require an exact room where, with exact dimensions to be built uh, so the piece can be shown. And in this case here, it wasn't the case. We needed a much more open um, uh, feeling, a much more open floor plan for the show because you have uh, very unusually this colonnade on both sides of the staircase, uh, which is kind of like a narrow corridor in a way. Then you have this gigantic room also with columns at one end and the other end, you know, some gallery spaces. So we had three kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems to solve, if you want. And at the time too, we were talking about doing interventions in the permanent galleries with, uh, with just one or two, maybe three pieces dotted around the, 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 the museum, the classical museum in a way. And so, but as we were working more and more, we realized that that wasn't necessary, that it was better to have the whole journey complete in one place and not kind of scattered around. Um, so, uh, so, the, the, so yeah, it, it, was, it was, everything, as I say, begins with the space. So what inspired Bill in cathedrals. So why has he developed this particular interest in cathedrals? Um, again, I think it's, it's the volume of space um, uh, and especially, uh, well, we, anytime anybody walks into a cathedral, we're incredibly impressed. We're impressed because of the history of the building itself uh, of, um, uh, of how old it is, of how large it is, uh, and how incredible it was to build something like that sometimes uh, hundreds of years ago, even a thousand years ago. Um, but especially there's a, there's, a, there's a feeling, it's kind of like a patina that's being built up of memories. Like, you know, when Durham Cathedral, when there's a Ah, here we are, fantastic, <laughs> and here's Durham Cathedral. Um, it, uh, it, 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 there, it, there's a thousand years of weddings, of funerals, of people praying, of people coming together as a community, of terrible things, you know, sometimes happen in cathedrals, in churches. So there's this enormous weight of history and how to include how to how to work with that hand in hand and not try to put something in there that is not going to be uh, uh, it, it's it's not going to grate on the on the atmosphere of the building itself so so here durham is is enormous it's really big um, and uh, so we as i was saying that we there was no way that we thought we could put something in this space that was already so filled up with everything. But if we look at the next image, uh, you can see that we succeeded. This is a piece called The Messenger. It's from 1996. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, this is the, uh, the, the opposite of the, of the altar, uh, the, the large stained glass window. And below that is actually what used to be the main entrance door which was closed because one of the bishops wanted to have his, uh, 
you know, his funeral, his, uh, his casket at the main <laughs> entrance. So they closed the whole thing off, you enter through the side now. So this work is, uh, is, is, is a naked man uh, uh, rising and, and falling in water. Uh, and so it's kind of like represents a cycle of birth and rebirth. And um, so it, it successfully, and it has sound as well. So it kind of successfully integrated into the feeling of this uh, cathedral. So we can go to the next image. Um, and as you were mentioning, Alina, this is the Church of San Gallo. Um, uh, it's a deconsecrated church, it's 15th century. Um, it's in Venice in Italy. Uh, and um, so as you can see, it, it's hugely different from Durham where it's just a small, tiny little community church. It was a small, tiny community church. And so, um, so in fact, the interior of it becomes the whole piece. And interestingly enough, there's, there's still some um, things on the walls from that time. They haven't, they haven't taken everything out and they never took out the marble altars. And there are two altars and we can show some of the images now. Uh, the next image, please. Um, here's one of the altars. It's the main altar. It was, um, it exactly fit almost exactly fit a very large plasma screen at the time, which was the biggest one that they made, which was 111, 112 inches. And, um, and uh, on this, the, if you can show the next image, please. Um, uh, as you can see here, that's the interior and it's very small. It really is pretty much what you see. And the, the, the side images uh, are 65 inch plasmas. And again, they fit very nicely into this, you know, 500 year old altars, which uh, was incredible. So the church of course is made of stone. The most amazing experience that I had with this piece, uh, once it got turned on after we installed it, it looked like uh, the people were coming out of the stone walls and into the space. And once they went through a wall of water, the, um, the person becomes, looks, looks like they're living. It looks like they've entered the space of the church. And then they turn and return back through the stone walls. It was an, an extraordinary experience. Um, okay, we can move on to St. Paul's Cathedral now. Which, uh, which is another um, huge, humongous um, building. Uh, we were asked to make two pieces there, uh, one piece called Martyrs and the other called Mary. And so again, uh, if you stop there for a second, again, as you can see, you know, it's, it was a <laughs> very difficult. It took us years. In fact, it took 13 years before this piece was actually finished. Um, so, um, so here it is installed uh, in Christopher Wren's amazing 17, uh, I think it was completed in 1697. Uh, and here's a close up image of Martyrs uh, as it was installed in this alcove. This is the very back of the cathedral, uh, completely in the opposite direction of the entrance. But even from the entrance, because this is emitting light and its movement, you can see uh, uh, you can see the piece uh, as we see it installed here. Okay, the next image on the other side uh, of these acquire aisles. On the other side of the aisle, we have a piece uh, called Mary uh, installed uh, in this location, and as you can see, it's a triptych. Uh, and uh, this work is about uh, 13 minutes long. And so if, uh, so it, it, it's there on a permanent basis. Um, okay, so where else do we go? We then go to the Paris Opera. Um, uh, well, oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is another image of um, Mary. 
So the project that we did for uh, Tristan and Isolde, you know, it's a 19th century German opera. We, we thought uh, Peter Sellers was crazy when he came to us and said, you know, let's work on, <laughs> on, this, uh, on this project. We had no idea um, uh, what, um, you know, what, this, what, what to do. You know, we never worked with an opera before. Uh, this is the opera in concert version. You see the LA Philharmonic there. Uh, and uh, again, it's a giant screen. I think it was about uh, 10, 11 meters high uh, and wide. Uh, for the first two acts, the screen is sideways and then it rotates to the vertical position. We can show the next image. And there you see Firewoman, which is one of the pieces that you have in the ex exhibition. Uh, you can see how huge the screen is. And there's this old, that's the very last image of the, of the opera. Um, and that was uh, first presented as uh, in concert version. As you can see, it's just a concert hall and the orchestra is on the stage. Um, but then we, uh, we did a, full, a fully um, staged version in the Paris uh, Bastille. So if you could show the next image, please. This is uh, Stefano Pace. He, he came uh, from Paris to our studio to work with us on, the, uh, on this, to figure out the size of the screens. The, the object on the, the, uh, the black object is literally, they had shipped us the entire fully to scale model <laughs> of the Bastille Paris opera. So we, it was great because, and there's Bill on the left, uh, we were able to, and there's a little, you can see a little, uh, the scale of the person below, so you can see how large the screen is. So we were able to, to do the, the sets completely for this, um, for this uh, opera house. Uh, so if you could show the next image. And there you see uh, Ruth Waltz is the photographer for the next few images. She does an amazing job um, documenting uh, for the for operas. And so you can see the scale and we even change uh, the uh, aspect ratio of, the, of some of the shots. So it's not so wide, not 16.9. And there the screen is vertical now. Uh, these are different parts of the opera. And there's the Tristan's Ascension, which you have uh, also at, in, the, um, uh, in the Pushkin. So it takes on, as you can see, it takes on a whole different feeling. All of a sudden, you know, like this is now um, part of something else. And so these pieces can be either seen uh, individually, separately, sometimes with their own sound, or they can be presented in, in this opera in this particular way. Peter did a, an amazing job with the, with the staging and the, um, uh, and with the direction. So I think that might be that if you can move to the next image. Okay, so, so um, it's not just the, the commissions uh, that where we have to really, as I, we were discussing earlier about the Pushkin um, Museum, it's not just the commissions that we have to uh, work with uh, in terms of the um, um, uh, in terms of the space, but also when we're designing exhibitions. This is uh, um, the DuPont Museum in Tilburg in the Netherlands. Uh, this used to be a uh, wool sorting factory. So there's a lot of skylights and, uh, uh, and it's really extensive. It's quite large. As you can see, uh, there's the outside of the, uh, of the space that we used. Um, in this facility, they have a very long area, as you can see, <laughs> um, a very long area that has 13 identical small wool sorting rooms. And so um, we were asked to do an exhibition in these rooms. Uh, and as you can see, there's the corridor. So we asked them, we said, you have to build a wall all the way along so that these rooms are protected from the light and protected from the rest of the space. And they actually did it. It was extremely long. 
But each of these little rooms, uh, they asked us to put uh, a piece in each of the rooms. And so we, we decided we would create a, a work, uh, like an exhibition called Intimate Works. And so uh, each of these rooms, as you can see, contained, that's the reflecting pool in there, contained a small piece. It was a really lovely show. I really enjoyed working on that. So, um, we showed uh, a small work like the four hands. Um, can we keep going? Uh, it seems like there's no Russian translation. Is that right? <clears throat> uh, um, I'm working, so there must be the translation must be on. I'm not sure uh, what the issue is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. That's the problem on the other end. They need to uh, oh, they click need on the globe icon. Yeah, mm -hmm. they need to okay. enable the translation. Okay. So uh, this is one of the small works that we showed. Uh, you can continue with the slides now. The next one, uh, there's Bill with a, with a work of his called um, Nine Attempts to Achieve Immortality. It's a self-portrait. Uh, and the next, next one is a piece called Memoria. It's actually projected onto a piece of silk, which is quite beautiful. The silk moves a little bit uh, with the air and uh, it's a very, very grainy, uh, um, a grainy uh, piece. This person moves in and out of the light. And so he disappears into the grain uh, at times, and then he appears again into the grain, and sometimes he's sad, and sometimes he's, you know, uh, sometimes he's happy. So it's it's a very slow moving, but, but on the edge, on very much on the edge of of, uh, of perception. Okay, the next um, the next um, um, space I want to show you is the Dijkdalhallen in Hamburg. Um, this is. Um, uh, the director Dirk Lockow and Bill is on the right. And you can see how enormous this space is. This was a, uh, a former coffee warehouse. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's basically an enormous, gigantic, empty space. And so <laughs> we had to create everything. Um, in some cases, we wanted to actually see uh, and expose the ceiling because it's so beautiful. Uh, and so these, these pieces that emit light are able to handle the ambient light uh, being exposed this way. Other times we had to build a box, as you can see, this, is a, this was a small viewing room um, of, um, uh, of videotapes, screenings that we showed. Uh, and the next image uh, is, uh, as you can see, there's this firewoman again. This is, they, they, they covered <laughs> a good part of the, um, the skylights. So it, it was dark enough for us to show this piece. Uh, this is a, uh, and this work as well. These are 10 meter high screens. Um, so we adapted to this space. We had to adapt to this space because it was so enormous. Um, and the next, um, the next uh, place that I want to show you is the Guggenheim Bilbao. Again, I mean, it's a, you know, Frank Gehry's very famous museum in Spain. But as you can see, there's no straight wall <laughs> anywhere in this building. And it is huge. It is absolutely enormous. Uh, these are the, this is the model that we started off with of, of the different galleries that we were given to work with. So as you can see, again, there's like one box and the others have, you know, curved walls, all kinds of shapes and sizes of build of, and ceiling heights, everything. This is, this is the genius of Frank, but, but very, very uh, interesting to, to work with. Um, there was like one gallery area that was called the classical galleries. And the rest, as you can see, is fantasy. But it's also felt like a cathedral um, with radiating chapels. The, this, the first floor that we worked with has a walkway all the way around. Um, and, uh, and so, and then you could um, uh, see the, um, 
uh, you could go in and out of these kind of chapel-like galleries and see different pieces. This is how we solved, this is a gallery. <laughs> this is how we solved one of the, one of the installations. Um, okay, so Alina, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about uh, how the, we talked a little bit already about how the um, Pushkin was installed, but if you could fill us in a little bit on that. Yeah, let me add a couple of words about how we created our exhibition in the Pushkin Museum. Kira, thank you very much for saying a couple of words already about uh, the fact that the perception of the space actually informs the exhibition itself. Uh, here in the Pushkin Museum, uh, we had quite a challenging task in front of us because um, we are a heritage building, so we cannot change anything. Uh, we cannot make any amendments or um, yeah, basically alter anything in the architecture. So the uh, challenge in front of us was to in, to make uh, the exhibition look organic in the existing spaces. And here uh, we uh, you can see the thirtieth room, and uh, this is quite a big screen that you see in front of you. And uh, we are using also big speakers. We use um, four point one sound stereo. It was an interesting solution, I believe, from the point of view of engineering and from the technical point of view. And yet again, I must say that we had to be very delicate with the space. And even the fixtures had to be very small and light. So Kira, would you like to add anything about the exhibition or would you like to switch to the next question shall i switch to the well, next question or yeah we can uh, just in just one moment this with this, this photograph will show you you know the kind of effects that we wanted to have you know we wanted to make sure that um, this you know tristan's ascension is actually framed in this doorway so you need to see that you need to be able to see the exhibition from all different angles you know not just when you're inside the room but it needs to create a harmonious whole and so uh, behind us in this picture, in this in, is uh, the Quintet of the Astonished, which also, if you're standing on the other side, it, it also frames that gallery as well. So there's a, there's a great balance, balancing act that we had to perform here and make sure that the, that the smaller screens on the sides were, or were also fitting into the columns. So uh, congratulations to the museum. I, it was just, it, I'm just floored and amazed. <laughs> I wish I could come and see it. <laughs> okay. Yep. Thank you very much, Kira. We were also very happy to work on that exhibition together with you. Yeah, so it was an amazing feat. That's true. We were working virtually. So all of these placements, so to speak, of the works in space was done virtually online with the pictures, with the videos. And that was amazing. But at the same time, we managed to find all the solutions. We managed to fit all the screens in space, both the smaller ones and the bigger ones. Almost all screens are vertical. And this is quite different from the paintings which we normally exhibit in, in classical museums, in, in our museum too. Normally, um, paintings are horizontal, but in our exhibition, we have uh, two works that are horizontally oriented. That's Mirage. Two pieces. They were shot in Mojave Desert, not far from California. These two uh, pictures depict two characters that um, travel around the desert and they see um, the impressions. A similar work, as far as I know, was done before by Bill Viola, but it was done in the Sahara Desert and during a journey that Kira, as far as I know, you did together 
in the 70s and the 80s together with Bill. So Kira, if that's okay with you, I wanted now to switch to these juniors, to your traveling. How did traveling inform your art? Okay. And oh, I have one more practical question, if, if that's okay. Um, how easy was it to travel in the 20th century, in the 70s, in the desert, and when you went back there in 2010s, did you feel any difference? Um, well, of course, um, you know, traveling in, um, in the desert is always very difficult and you have to take a lot of precautions. Um, but Bill, Bill wanted to make this work, uh, which it became titled Chad al Jarid, which is a portrait in light and heat. Some of it was shot in the um, uh, in a in a in this in a storm in Saskatchewan, in uh, in in uh, in Canada, um, and then and uh, the 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 heat part of it was shot in Tunisia. So as you can see, um, it was pretty crude, <laughs> pretty basic traveling. All of our suitcases were piled. We arrived in in the in Tozer. This is arriving in Tozer. Um, by train, we get off the train station. Of course, there's no taxi. This was the taxi <laughs> uh, to our little hotel that we had. Uh, we rented a car, of course, after that, and um, we were able to, to, to travel around. But uh, this uh, is Bob Balecki, who, who was with us for a short time. He's an audio engineer. He worked a lot with, uh, with Bill and myself uh, doing audio. Um, so, there's a very, as you can see, the equipment is very crude. This is a 500 millimeter lens and uh, it was extremely hot. So we were recording in a hot part of the year, in a hot part of the day. And uh, in order to get uh, the maximum uh, results with mirages, we were looking to see um, what, uh, what, you know, what, uh, what, we, what, what, what we could see without that the eye couldn't see, you know, um, it, it was it was traditional for mystics and other spiritual seekers uh, to spend time in the desert. Um, the the desert's a symbol of isolation and also deprivation. And um, what you see with the eye, with your eye, is not always what is there. And so there's this play between illusion and reality. You're always asking yourself. You know, if you don't have heat stroke, <laughs> uh, asking yourself, what, what is it? What are we actually seeing? You know, and then and then you really feel that, you know, like uh, traversing vast distances can represent a lifespan. And uh, so those two works that you mentioned that are on view, uh, which were recorded more, much more recently, uh, really represent the the lifespan of a human being, you know, and, the, uh, and their journey. So there's, I guess we missed one, but that's all right. That's just very similar. Um, as you can see, there's nothing out there. There's nothing out there. And this is now on a salt lake. So it's very white and very glary. And we were recording um, in the distance, you can see on the horizon, on, on the horizon of the, of the lake, um, a little black dot, and we were we were we were recording um, um, how uh, our journey towards that towards that dot. And in the next image, you will see that that dot is actually a little pool of water, and it was red. I think there was some kind of algae there or something like that. It was like the most bizarre thing out in the middle of this, out of, in nowhere. So it, it was, yeah, the, it, this was quite difficult to, uh, to keep ourselves hydrated and fed. Um, and as you mentioned, the El Mirage Dry Lake, uh, this is in the Mojave Desert in Southern California. Oh, actually, we can see one or two stills. If you could uh, just forward uh, go. Th this is what we were recording um, from a great distance, from a huge distance. And uh, when it's moving, the whole thing is shimmering light and color. It's very, very beautiful. And next image. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, on the top there, you can see little houses 
and the rest of it is just the desert and the different layers of uh, of of sand and color and whatever, and you you really can't tell what it is um, because it's everything is just shimmering. It's really beautiful. Okay, so let, we'll go to the dry lake, uh, the El Mirage next. So <laughs> as you can see, it's quite a big difference. This was our tent city that we created uh, for uh, quite a large project, but we also recorded there the encounter and walking on the edge. So, you know, we have places where we can cool off. We have places that we can, you know, like uh, there are trailers we can go into. <laughs> we had to do, we had to do everything. We had to almost, we didn't live there, but it was almost like we were living there for one week. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, one of the, this is the space that we had created for viewing what was being uh, recorded because we had to really see very carefully uh, that, that the shot was working. Um, Harry, this is Harry Dawson in the, in the hat next to me. Oh, that's me there and Harry Dawson um, standing up. Uh, he's the direct, he's been, been our director of photography since 1992. You can see Bill just behind me and then the person uh, with the white t-shirt is our um, uh, assistant director. He, he, he calls all the shots and he, he does the scheduling throughout the whole day. So yeah, it's a much bigger, much huge, very huge difference between when we first, we've shot in the desert a few times, but th those are the two extremes. Uh, okay, and then there's an image of uh, this, how we recorded uh, walking on the edge. You can see the, the cones, uh, the, the two uh, actors could not, uh, were, were, not, um, were, not able, were not allowed to walk outside of those cones. When you're, when you're out there like a mile away, you cannot tell how to walk in a straight line. So you need all the help you can get. <laughs> uh, and the two people in the back, they're the PAs, the production assistants, who work on, walk on the outside of the cones with walkie talkies and they um, are helping to direct the, the two actors walking correctly. And that's Bill giving them instructions. Okay, so the next uh, image. Uh, and this is how we did walking on the edge. Again, we have the two PAs on the outside and uh, the two actors on the inside, but uh, they were just, they just lined up for the, for the shot. But um, they again had to walk inside the, the cones. And because, it's a, because we were shooting with um, uh, um, a macro lens, uh, telephoto lenses, uh, I think that was actually where the beginning of the frame is where these people are standing. And so that the, um, anyway, it's, 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 it's quite, it, it, technically it was quite a difficult feat to create these works. But as you can see how beautiful it is, this is a dry lake, it's not a salt lake like the shot was, but it's, uh, and we, we were very lucky we had good weather too. Here it seems that we can also discuss all the works separately because it seems absolutely astonishing how many technical details each and every work has. Yeah. Yeah. That you had to plan the work, you had to build the scones that would separate the straight line. That is absolutely hard to imagine what difficult issues can arise while developing a work. Well, but we also had to think of the, medic, the health and well-being of the actors. So we had to have a medic on staff uh, and we had to have plenty of water, plenty of you know, uh, hydration, plenty of food, everything to, to make sure that everyone was safe. Yeah, of course, that is very important as well. 
So we can move on. And to you see the difference between uh, 1979 and uh, <laughs> 2000s. And maybe now we could turn to my next question. Yeah. Sure. Bill has always worked with state of the art technology. And he applied this technology to create this mirages or to play with our perception. Because in a lot of the works that we see, we see it, we believe that we see a reality, but we see only a reflection. Or we think that there is nothing in the front of a person, and then we'll see water emerging. And then there is also the use of different cameras, CCTV cameras or HD cameras. So I wanted to ask how and why is there this uh, wish to work with perception, to work, to play with the viewer? So where does that come from? Would also like to know whether you ever went back on uh, filming something because the technology was not good enough. Um, and we also know that, uh, for instance, the uh, Star Wars was uh, filmed, refilmed because the technology became better. So have you ever uh, found that a difficult thing, that technology was not good enough? Well, that's a lot of different questions. We could talk for three hours on this. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, none of these things are kind of playing games you know i think i think bill um, has always wanted he, he's always used technology so that he can have some kind of control of uh, the semblance of of time for example he can go backwards and forwards uh, he can slow things down he can speed things up um, and so once you change the once you change real time as we know it once you go in, you're in a different world. You're no longer in our world. And so, so um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the technology came first. Um, and some, but sometimes he was pushing it. Other times he was pushing it to the limits, you know, whatever was there. So we, we didn't really wait for things to, to develop, but we used things very quickly as they start, as they were developing. Um, but sometimes he even used the characteristics of the tape itself, you know, and uh, for, for an effect. This, this piece that we see now on the screen is called Passage. It's from 1987. It was premiered at MoMA in New York. Um, and it uses, it, to play it back, it uses actually an editing system live in the gallery, you know, like it's hidden, of course, uh, in the installation itself. Um, Bill shot and edited uh, a 23 minute piece, but shot it very quickly so that, you know, things are kind of moving around. He would zoom in, would zoom out. He would well look at in faces. He would look at, but it was, it was a, four, a four year old birthday party. So it's children. And so, so then this 23 mi minute edit at that time was edited onto a beta cam videotape. And the edit machine played it back in very slowly. So it's literally stretching the tape. <laughs> so it was about a 1 16th speed. And so the whole thing plays back in about seven and a half hours. So you literally see every single frame go by of this 23 minute uh, piece. And so, um, and it shows every little, the whole, thing. Bill was working, he was trying to see how far you could stretch the emotions. And you can, in emotions, as you can see, you know, they can be still, but even in every single frame, you could still see the emotions being stretched and stretched and stretched and, in, and with the same force that it was if you were just looking at it, you know, normally. So, so this, I don't know how you would play this piece back now because we don't have those machines, although we still do. But, but this is this is using the tape 
and using an edit machine. So it was very, very interesting. Okay, the next, um, and that, that's, it, it, it's huge. This is really, really big. It was rear projected and you walked into this room where you had to really um, view it very close up. So you were almost inside this birthday party. Okay, next. Um, so the continuing development of editing equipment was very important. Uh, it was key in order to be able to rotate the image. So in a piece like Surrender, which is in the exhibition, uh, um, you can see that uh, these are two different screens, um, but the work actually was shot, we shot the reflection and not the person. So, and then you flip it upside down and then you, you see it as if it's you know, normal. However, if you shoot the reflection, once the person goes down and touches the water with their face, the water is disturbed. And so the face is disturbed. And, um, so, and it breaks down. So it's like there's a disintegration of the self. And so it's, you don't really know how this happened, you know, when you're watching it but then you realize that it's actually the reflection that we're shooting. Um, and, the same, um, and the same also with the, the next work that you have in the exhibition, Is Old as Ascension, um, which um, is subtitled The Shape of Light in the Space After Death. And so this is underwater clearly, however, she's rising and so the way that this was shot of course is that she she goes in backwards upside down and then later on the whole shot is rotated so that she's actually rising instead of sinking so you'll see in the next shot this is how it was done so she's waiting and waiting and holding on and then when everything's ready she she falls in backwards. And this this is a, she's a, she was amazing. She worked for Cirque du Soleil, so she is an aerial artist, and so she understands how to work with water as well. Um, she also had to stay inside this very narrow vertical frame. So I don't know how she did it. She was brilliant. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, slow motion uh, that um, Bill was doing this. Uh, it's a well-known technique of Bill's, of course. And, uh, but he began to experiment with it a long time ago. In 1976, he made a piece called Truth Through Mass Individuation. And he was editing it at, at, at uh, WNET, which was a New York television station. Uh, they, had a, they had a laboratory there and they invited artists to use and work with their equipment because this was a fairly early on in television history. And they also, they wanted to see, because artists of course are always, you know, experimenting much more than their engineers are. And uh, they wanted to see what artists could do. So, so for that, I don't have an image of that, but, but they used, um, a, some kind of a drum to stretch the videotape that was recorded to, to make it into uh, slow motion. So even from 1976, Bill was using that. Um, up until the year 1999, uh, we were producing large scale room size pieces that usually included projections on, uh, on uh, screens or on the walls themselves. Um, the revolutionary advent of flat panels, the flat screens uh, that could be installed in a home changed all of that. Suddenly we were creating intimate works and exploring the different ways of using screens uh, vertically um, or stripped of the frame or in multiples. So it just was an explosion for Bill of, of, of being creative, of creativity. Uh, this was a huge influence on him as he worked on the Passion series, um, which was an examination of the, of the emotions. There are some examples of that in the exhibition. Okay. 
um, maybe we can, if we have time, we can, if we have time, we can go behind the scenes. Yes, we do have time. So mm -hmm. let's go to Firewoman now. And I wanted to uh, show a short clip of the Firewoman to remind our audiences what it looks like. And then we are going to share some of the backstage uh, photos. I believe that this work produces a really strong impression, especially if you are in the space of the exhibition. So a short excerpt of the fire woman. So the next clip you'll see is um, uh, is uh, recorded actually during production. So uh, uh, it's it's I might talk over it or let's just see it. out on the market, you know, see people play with it. It's the violet steel. You remember you had it on your twenty.
it up a tiny amount. Well, what happened was I was wrong. It's, you got to go down and down. Would you like to comment on this video? How was it shot? Um, or anything about the production itself? This is very interesting to watch, but I'm sure that the uh, audience is also eager to find out more details. Well, as you can clearly see, uh, we're aiming for the reflection of the water in the water rather than, um, uh, rather than shooting the person uh, as, as she is. Uh, the, the pool itself is enormous. We had to calculate everything correctly. Uh, it is about um, 90 feet, which is about uh, 30 meters, uh, 30 meters long. So as you can see, it's really, really big. Uh, I'm not sure why the video is kind of stopping and starting, but that's okay. Uh, and then the, the, that's the crew, the camera crew is at the, uh, as you can see in the middle there, uh, they, um, the camera would be pointing into the water and not up at the scene. The, 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 the flame, flaming trees are, were gas, uh, uh, you know, gas trees, metal, metal trees that were created with gas uh, flames. Uh, everything is real. I mean, we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't usually create, uh, you know, special effects that, that are not real or not based in some kind of reality. There's Bill. So it, it was an enormous project. Uh, here is uh, Robin Bonacursi. Uh, she's, she's a stunt woman. Uh, the heat was enormous where she's standing uh, when the when the trees are lit, and uh, so she underneath all of her clothing she wore there was some uh, special um, fireproofing material that she had on, and also some fireproofing gel so she wouldn't get burnt, and she couldn't stand there for very long, um, so it, it everything happened rather quickly. We were shooting with a um, uh, with a, a, a 35 millimeter film camera that records. It was very special, and there were only four of these in Hollywood. Uh, it records 300 frames a second, which is really, and it allows you then. It's really, really beautiful, smooth slow motion, um, but you could, you have to record everything very quickly. So. Um, we had a thousand feet of film, which went by in a um, minute, a minute and a half. So you, you, you didn't have a lot of time to shoot. Um, and as you can, this, this was one of our largest projects. And this is only a short part of the whole opera. <laughs> so, um, and, there were, there, and Tristan's Ascension was actually shot in the same place I think we use this. We use the same pool. We had to do everything sideways um, because with him, the 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 reason for a a pool, or maybe we built a different one, uh, is that you had to contain all the water. There's so much water that falls with Tristan's ascension that you had to contain it. You couldn't let it just dribble out onto the floor. And as you can see, we're testing now uh, the reflection. Uh, and so we had to, you know, suspend that stage over the water. It was pretty big. Uh, and that's uh, the person on the left is the, um, the stunt supervisor. He's the one who makes sure about all of the safety precautions. And actually he was the one also in Isolde's ascension where he was holding uh, uh, Sarah before she fell backwards. Again, underwater, we had safety 
divers and whatever, just to make sure that, you know, if anything happened, they would grab her right away. So these are pretty dangerous projects. <laughs> uh, that's it. Yeah, I can also see a comment in the chat. Kirill wrote that this looked like a complex technological production process, not at all like an artist in the open air. So thank you very much for this story. Yeah. We have a little bit of time for a Q&A session. And I think we will be happy to take a few questions from the audience. You're welcome to write your questions in the chat and Kira will be happy to answer them. I will go through the questions we have already. We have a question here. Why don't you have sound in all works? For example, on our exhibition, we have uh, sound only in the colonnade and in the 30th room. You said that Bill worked a lot with the sound and we can remember his collaboration with David Tudor, but not all of his works use sound. Why is that so? That's a really good question. Um, previous to, it actually came about when, uh, when, when we were working on the Passions series from, from 1999. Um, before that, uh, we, we recorded, uh, it used to be that we recorded sound with absolutely everything, but then when we started using uh, uh, more technology and, and like crews and whatever, we, we were not able to use the sound on the site, you know, at, on the recording site at the same time, we had to build it uh, from, uh, from uh, different sources. Um, but the passions, um, and I was kind of even very surprised myself, you know, why aren't we recording sound? Well, the emotions, you had to have room to experience the emotions. And if you have sound, then it doesn't, it doesn't work. It means that you can't experience your own emotions. And so, so the emotions themselves produce a, some kind of a sound in ourselves you know, and, and it's not necessary, you know, and they're in such slow motion that it's, that, that, uh, that it, it's not necessary. Um, that's, that's, that, that's pretty, pretty much, you know, it's, it's just, it's just no room for it. it. It's no room for then, for then you to have uh, the experience that, that, that Bill wants you to have. Thank you so much for your response. That is very unexpected. And I really love that you said when you stopped uh, using the sound that came for yourself unexpected as well. And now maybe another question connected to that. Can you give any hints uh, to the artists for, or to the viewers who are going to come to see the exhibition to better understand it? Oh, you mean how to how to view the exhibition? Yep. Yes, uh, how to see the exhibition, how to look at it, how to understand it. So some clues, some hints. Well, the, the, the biggest hint, the, my biggest advice is to give yourself enough time. Uh, first of all, enough time to to be able to because this is a time based exhibition. I mean, you know, you could spend a little bit of time and just see one piece or three pieces and then come back later on and see more. Or you can spend two or three hours in the exhibition easily um, and see, you know, gradually every piece, although that might be kind of a lot. But the, the, I always think that, that these, these exhibitions, are, we are giving you the gift of time, the gift to slow yourself down the gift to really absorb, you know, what it is that you're seeing, you know, we don't, we don't provide answers, you know, maybe many more questions <laughs> than uh, certainly no answers. And um, each of these pieces provide you with a, with a different experience as well. Some of them are a little overwhelming, some of them are strong, some of them are, you know, immersive, others are very 
contemplative, uh, like, you know, um, like the encounter when you're watching a young woman and an older woman connect at some point, she passes on her knowledge and then they, and then they go uh, and they, they connect only for a, a short moment and then, and then they continue on their life's journey. So, but also, as I was saying earlier, the, the, we've created a whole experience, a whole journey, you know, the, the stairs, we asked that they be lit dimly, the, the uh, spaces are darker, um, you know, the Tristan's ascension and fire women provide their own, they illuminate the whole room when they're being recorded. So, so it's, it's also a, a texture of light. Uh, there is some sound, of course, uh, a, a texture of light and darkness. Um, and, 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 and it becomes a self-reflection. Great. One more question related to it, Kira. Do you believe that the viewer should be prepared to meet the works of Bill Viola or they can come unprepared to, without any idea of what they're going to see? Um, either way, you know, it really depends on the, on the, on the viewer. I, I think um, I, 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 anybody can see these works, children can see these works and, and, ha and have some kind of a response to them. Um, if you know the works, it will give you a deeper understanding maybe of Bill's ideas. If you don't know the works, it will introduce you to Bill's ideas. So I don't think there's any right way of, of coming uh, to the exhibition. Uh, it just, just with an openness and just pre be prepared to spend some time. And now one more technical question. So first of all, the firewoman, what we see in the frame is a reflection, right? Right. And then another question related to that. Could you tell us more about filming the ascension of Tristan? Oh, <laughs> I should have brought some photographs for that too. Um, that, that was run in reverse. That whole sequence is run in reverse. Uh, so, so it starts off with, uh, with the, with the person, John Hay, who also an aerial artist, uh, starts off, uh, we built, um, our special effects supervisor built, uh, this thing that looks like a giant shower <laughs> on, uh, on the ceiling. And, uh, with lots and lots of water pipes coming up to this source of water. So John starts off inside this shower and he is drawn down uh, by uh, a harness. He's wearing a harness, of course, uh, as the water uh, falls. Um, and so uh, he's drawn down and he has to find his spot on the laying down on the, on the slab he has to find it precisely. He has to land exactly in the right place. And then he has to uh, go through some motions that are, that are backwards, you know, like you know, being moving, standing up, you know, like anything. And then finally he comes to rest. And so when, when it's all done in reverse, um, he's, you see him first lying flat on the slab and uh, with just a few little drips of water, but the water is going up, <laughs> not going down. And so slowly, uh, and of course it's, it's very quiet. That's one of those times when the sound is very, it sounds very much like you're inside a church or a big metal tank. And um, the, the water starts dripping up and slowly and slowly and more and more and more. And then you see him starting to move and starting to uh, uh, to 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 ri rise up, and then he rises up, and then he goes up through the through the water. But all of that's in reverse. So instead of upside down, Bill r ran everything backwards. 
So yeah, it, it just even to come up with these concepts and to have lots of meetings and to have, you know, uh, a, a large crew of people who are involved in the idea uh, uh, is, is, is extraordinary. It's a really amazing experience to go through a production. Kira, thank you. And we, we have more questions on the space and I think there will be two questions, the two last questions that I ask. Our audience asks, do you think that in the future you could show Bill Viola's works in a church in Russia? Is that possible? Um, sure, why not? <laughs> We're Big fan of Andrei of uh, Andrei Rublev, so, <laughs> um, but I know his works are in museums. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean anything's possible. The most difficult thing about showing in a church, even if it's deconsecrated, it, it's usually old, and you are not allowed to touch anything: the walls, the ceilings. Sometimes there are already some pick points in the ceiling where you can hang a screen but that already has to be there. Uh, sometimes like in, we did a, an exhibition in Uppsala Cathedral, which is another huge cathedral in Sweden, um, where we, uh, yeah, again, but we showed smaller works and we built really nice, beautiful walls, uh, you know, just freestanding walls. And that's where we put a flat panel screen. We couldn't do a projection because there was nowhere to hang a projector from or or a, or, a, or a screen so so you have to always think about you know the historic consequences the you know the what what you can physically do in a space and then you adapt to that uh, the kinds of works that you can show so yeah we I'd love to show something in a Russian church and the last question and I will uh, combine several questions in it. What are your plans for the future? Maybe a project in the Russian church? And also one more interesting question. Do you have any list of places or spaces where you'd like uh, to show Bill Viola's works? So, is there some uh, top venue? Maybe it's even a venue that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, actually, I, it's something that I haven't really thought about because the projects come to us, you know, and so we're always, you know, um, working uh, on those projects. The next project will be in Finland, in Helsinki, actually, at the Amos uh, Rex Museum. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, there have been, of course, showing again in Russia would be wonderful. Um, we have shown in Istanbul. Uh, we have shown, oh, it'd be nice to show in India. We have not actually had an exhibition in India. So that would be really interesting. The wonderful thing about the work is that it is universal. It doesn't require language. And the, the, the concepts and the themes that we're always dealing with are actually universal, are things that, that everybody at one point, at some point, has to think about, about their lives, about their future, about their passing, you know? And so th this, is, this is what's being discussed. This is what's being presented in, in these works. So I hope that, um, that the visitors can enjoy them you know, in this um, uh, in this wonderful museum uh, in Moscow, it's, it's just so thrilling that it's that's there. One more thing I want to say is I want to give a big thank you to Bobby Yablonsky from our studio, who worked very closely with Alina, uh, and so that this miracle of virtual and uh, vir not virtual but uh, you know remote uh, exhibition could take place. So uh, that's um, very. It's a new experience for all of us, I think. And uh, I think that this medium, uh, this technology that we're working in with now kind of fits in somehow to this crisis that we're all going through. 
that it's, uh, it's transmissible via the internet. And so, so all of a sudden in Moscow, I'm, you have this exhibition and in California, I'm speaking with you and you are in Moscow or anywhere else in the world. I don't know where everybody's from, but uh, that, that's an extraordinary situation. Um, uh, and, and we're fortunate that, that we can do this. Gira, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Your assessment of our work as well. And we are glad to cooperate with you. It is absolutely wonderful that we managed to put the exhibition together amidst the pandemic when all the borders are shut down. And it seems that uh, due to postponing the exhibition, this exhibition really acquired new shades and new meanings that could be lacking if we opened earlier. The space works greatly with the exhibition. Of course, that uh, seems not really humble from a person who works in a museum, but it's wonderful that the exhibition really works. Kira, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion, for the work that you carried out on the exhibition because it began back in 2015. It was the yeah. first time uh, you together with Bill came to Moscow and uh, that was the time when the exhibition was conceived and it's realized only now. Thank you so much. I'd like also, uh, so thanks Kira again, I'd like to thank your technical team, our technical team, and I would also like to um, say sorry for some technical problems that we had and we'll uh, take all of that into account and I hope uh, they will never happen again. So thank you. Um, the audience, our exhibition is supported by VTB Bank and we'd like to thank our partners because now the time is very difficult uh, for all cultural institutions and we are thankful to all our sponsors. The exhibition will last till the 30th of May. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, we have so-called long days when after the closure of the museum, you can still view the exhibition one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes these meetings um, will uh, have an introduction by Olga Shishko, as well as our tour people. So please, uh, you're all welcome and thank you for being with us. We'll glad, be glad to see you at our next meeting on the 7th of April. We'll have a talk by a wonderful art uh, critic, John Hanhart. He's the close friend of Kira and Bill. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much to the audience.